So I've got a question here which has come in for Jared. Um, so, Jared, if you're ready to answer that, that'd be great. Um, sure. Given the, good, given the good outlook for the season, do you imagine allocations will rise fairly rapidly this year? And I presume by this year that's looking at 2021. 20, 20, yeah. So it's a, it's a very good question, and it's all dependent on exactly how much rainfall and inflows um, that you get. So you know, what is clear that we need to recover the volume of water um, sitting in storage. Like if you look back at where we went to this year, we had, it was I think about storages in 2019-20, peaked at around about 4,100 gigalitres, and around that time was when we got to 100% allocation so you've got to have you know quite reasonable uh, volumes of water uh, flowing into the storages uh, this year you know just because we you know we look at the rainfall outlook and we're going well 70 to 80 percent chance of exceeding uh, median rainfall that doesn't directly translate to you know median inflows either so we need to recognize that some areas of you know the catchments um, albeit they are wetting up still require some reasonable rainfall before you get them really primed uh, for future inflows and storages. But certainly if you had a really wet conditions, um, allocations can improve quite quickly. Um, I've got a second one here for you, Jared, as well, if I can, seeing as you're on the mic. Um, sure. Why has the water flow through the Barmer Choke been reduced from what it was in the late 1980s and 90s is the question? And yep. there's a follow-on statement. I thought the flow was around 2,000 megalitre per day. It now seems to be around eight to 10,000 megalitres yeah. per day. Okay, yep. So with the Barmer Choke, um, so that, that's a natural constriction in, in the River Murray. So uh, that's around the Barmer Millor Forest um, area for people that may not know where the Barmer uh, choke is, and what what has happened over time is there's been a gradual reduction to the capacity uh, through the choke. Um, going back probably you know, sort of 20 to 30 years ago, the capacity was more like around about 12,000 megs a day, 11 and a half, 12,000 megs a day in that range. But what has been clear over time that that capacity has been eroded. Now, some of the recent survey work done up there has certainly shown quite large deposits of uh, silt and sand within the Barmer Choke, which is reducing uh, the capacity of the Barmer Choke to deliver volumes of water which you could have delivered you know, 20 to uh, 30 uh, years ago. So that's one issue which is certainly being actively looked at by the Murray-Darling Basin Authority and, and how flows through the Barmer Choke can be managed and you know, there's options being investigated to improve the capacity of the choke measures have been put in place this year to, uh, importantly for people to note, to transfer water around the choke due to that reducing capacity at the Barman Choke. Thanks, Jared. Um, I've got a question here on the desalination plant. I don't know, uh, Dan Jordan, if this is one for you. Um, so the question is, is the desalination plant in Adelaide forecast to be running at 100% capacity indefinitely given the low forecast inflows? Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, look, it's probably too soon to give a strong statement on that point. Um, it really depends on how water availability improves uh, across here and when, it, and when it improves. But in general terms, any decision, I guess, on whether to run the plant or not is a commercial one for SA Water, operating within the framework set up under the River Murray Water Allocation Plan. So given SA Water has access to multiple sources for Adelaide, including desal, um, the current WAP already sets out a process whereby, um, I guess, Adelaide has had a cut of 50 gigs in dry years. And the benefits we irrigators from this cut is basically realised when uh, entitlement reaches um, 850 gigs and a full 8 percentage points of benefit is realised as entitlement reaches 900 gigalitres in a year. So anything above that kind of uh, cut to Adelaide and boost to irrigators is really a political call for government outside of the WAP process. Uh, noting that I guess last year people would know that the government um, reached an agreement with the Commonwealth Government around the so-called Water for Fodder Program, which released water on the back of detail production in 1920. And that particular agreement is being reviewed as we speak, and we should have an outcome for that review process um, in the coming months. So in some ways that will also be a factor in how the desal plan is deployed 
and for what purpose uh, in the year ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Dan. Um, I've, I've had a, a question on the slides come in saying, can we make them any bigger? Um, some of them were a little hard to read. Um, so I think I can respond to that one. It is possible on your screen, I understand, if you click on the slides to make them a bit bigger. Uh, but we will also be uh, making the webinar available uh, probably sometime mid next week, I think, at this stage. Um, and in doing that, we'll endeavour to make sure that uh, everything is able to be uh, large enough to be seen on the screen. Um, I've had another question come in around water brokers um, and what is the AWBA? Um, so I'm probably best placed to field that one uh, at this stage. So the Australian Water Brokers Association um, and many of the water brokers are members or affiliate members of the Water Brokers Association. Um, and they have some really good codes of practice and the like uh, to ensure that brokers are doing the right thing by, by you as a market participant. Um, so I, I always fall in the camp of encouraging you to work with uh, AWBA member brokers um, because uh, I know that they're uh, subject to their code of practice. Um, I've got another question here that I think is one for you, Jared, um, and it's what is the volume of water that the environmental water holder is taking from storage at this point in time? Yep. So that's a very good question, uh, and it's a question we often uh, get. So the environmental water holders, um, they obviously hold the same class of uh, entitlements that you know, other uh, people hold. So you know, in South Australia, it's Class three, they hold you know, Victorian Murray High Reliability Water Share and, and uh, similarly in New South Wales. So environmental water holders, they will always look at carrying over um, certain amounts of water in between years, but they, they have certainly you know, delivered quite reasonable volumes of, of water this year. I don't have those exact uh, numbers in front of me, but certainly with the information that we uh, provide out, we can, you know, work with the environmental water holders and, and get some information from them around uh, how much water they have uh, leased uh, this year and how much they're looking at uh, carrying over into uh, the following year. Um, you know, they, they certainly you know, put a lot of information already out there in the public domain. I know on the on the CHU, so the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office website, they have uh, portfolio statements available on their website that uh, shows how much water they have used um, so far. So I don't have the exact numbers on me, but he'll be happy to uh, help facilitate getting that information for people. Fantastic, thanks, Jared. Um, I've got a, this is great, there's a lot of questions coming in, so thank you guys for raising these questions. Um, trying to get, work our way through as many of them as they pop up on the screen in front of me as we go. Um, two part question, I'll take the first half of it and um, maybe someone from Persa could help me out with the other half of it, maybe Kim. Um, so why is the price of water skyrocketing is the first part of it. And then the second part is what support is available for small growers that are being impacted by drought and these high prices? Uh, well, look, as I've just talked through in the presentation, what happened in 19... 20 was actually very similar to what we witnessed in the Millennium Drought. Um, with constrained allocation availability across the Southern Basin, uh, basically we saw prices go up as it moved up price points for different crop types. And fortunately, at the back end of this year, with some renewed optimism around water availability and soil moisture levels, um, the market has, has backed away but undoubtedly it, it does make it difficult um, for people because it, it's very hard to budget on the sort of prices that, that have been witnessed in the market. But um, I would encourage people to be thinking that way for next water year, uh, unless there's a real turn in terms of water availability. If I can then um, maybe, Kim Watson, are you, or, sorry, Walton, are you in a position to respond to the second half of that question? Yeah, thanks, Rod. Um, there's a range of um, 
support and initiative measures available to help people through dry conditions and drought uh, administered by PERSA. Um, the services are available on our website, which is one of the resources that you can access through this webinar um, and encourage people to, to, to um, follow that through. Uh, also, you can access all of our services through our drought hotline, which is 1800 931 314. The support uh, available um, ranges from uh, family and business support, uh, which uh, a lot of people in the Riverland would be familiar with um, as recently as the support offered through the recent uh, hailstorm back in November. Um, there's health and wellbeing, uh, farm advice, also the Rural Financial Counselling Service that's well known to a lot of people in the region. Um, there's other community support uh, and financial assistance measures. So there's a range of them available at the moment. And again, I'd encourage anybody to access the resources available in this webinar or contact our drought hotline through 1800 931 314 or send us an email and we'll provide that information. So thanks. No problems. Thank you, Kim. Um, so I've got another one here. When I think this is going to you, Jared, in your presentation, when referencing your allocation probability table for FY20, how did we get 100% allocations in SA under dry inflows? Yep. So yeah, it's a very good question. So uh, when we put out uh, some of the early forecasts, it was showing there was you know under that very dry sequence we might get to you know there was a 90% chance of getting to almost 80%. Um, our allocation. So it, it's important to note that the way in which the water availability assessments work, there's a lot of conservatism um, built into that, which that conservatism reduces the risk of potentially going backwards. So if we go back to 2006-07 where we had uh, inflows that were about 50% of the previous lowest minimum inflow on record. We started that year on 80% uh, went back to 60%. So we build that conservatism in to ensure that we are moving forward. Now, though, some of those numbers are you know, worse than what has ever been translated into in terms of historical observation. So there's very, very conservative numbers. Now, as you get, you know, as the rainfall starts to occur, we saw the inflows in the early part of last year, being July, August and September, uh, start to improve. And then, so that obviously improved water resource availability. We have other inputs like snowy hydro uh, input inflows into Hume, they start off with a really conservative number. Those inflows then ramp up uh, over time. Also, the NDBA sets aside a budget for transmission losses, so a, a specific volume of water is set aside uh, to cover off on the monthly um, transmission losses. Now, some months where you get reasonable rainfall over a, a widespread length of the River Murray system, that rainfall offsets that part of that loss requirement for, for that month. So then the Murray-Darling Basin Authority can advise us that we've had an improvement due to direct rainfall in the river offsetting uh, losses. So it, that's why I said it's, this stuff is quite complex. It's not just about exactly what flows into um, storage. It's also about when the rain you know, hits the river, basically from Hume downwards to the South Australian border, you can get uh, net gains um, due to lower evaporation and lower transmission losses due to that direct rainfall uh, on the river. But again, you know, we're putting out these very conservative forecasts. They get updated uh, each month and we'll provide, as we did last year, uh, you know, quite comprehensive information each month about how everything is tracking. So again, you know, need to realise those forecasts will change each month as water availability improves. Thanks, Rod. But just, Jared, picking up on that point, so you are inherently erring on the conservative side in this so that irrigators and other water users can plan on that basis, I take it? That's correct. So part of the feedback uh, from industry in the past has been they never want to go uh, backwards. So to be in that situation of never having to go backwards, like what we ha like what happened in uh, 2006 or uh, yeah, we are being... Uh, quite conservative by nature. So again, that's one of the factors that people need to keep in the back of your mind. Very conservative forecasts, you know, worst case scenario type uh, inflows, uh, which are built into the assessment. So when you get improved rainfall conditions, you get the improved uh, inflow conditions. Some months you'll have those lower losses. Snowy hydro can uh, push more water out at periods of time. So you sort of add all of those 
factors uh, into uh, the mix and then we end up with improved water availability. So at the start of the year, always very conservative uh, numbers and we'd be happy to you know, put a, when we put out these forecasts, put like a tracking line in there as well so people can see uh, how the actual improvements are tracking against those scenarios and that gives uh, people, you know, I guess, further insight into what scenario they might, may want to implement their planning around. Perfect. Thanks, Jared. Um, in the context of those um, announcements on available allocation, I've got a question here around um, are you going to be putting out sort of simple fact sheets as well as the more comprehensive information? So what's it going to look like on the 15th of April? Yeah, absolutely. So we will be putting out, so there'll be an announcement around the minimum opening allocation on, on the 15th of April. We'll also be uh, putting out water availability um, statements similar to what we uh, have done uh, in 2019-20 until we reach that 100% uh, allocation. We're also uh, working on a number of uh, frequently asked question documents here internally where more uh, information will be uh, put together and uh, where you know that, that information will be made. Uh, available and again yeah, we'll have some contact details there so if, if people don't quite understand uh, you know, what we're saying in those FAQs or have further questions uh, you know, again people are encouraged to get in contact with us and, and pick our brains. Excellent. Um, I've got a few questions that look like they're coming through in relation to the carryover policy. Um, so some questions around uh, are the rules changing? Have uh, decisions been made in terms of carryover and spill implications of it um, and the like? I wonder if um, is that, Jared, are you in a position to talk to what's happening in that space? Or is that... Dan and I might, yeah, Dan and I might do a tag team. Yep, thanks, Rod. Look, I guess just the quick answer on that one is that um, I guess the, the NRM board has consulted on a proposal to change or modify the current carryover policy. That's still under formal consideration by the government, and we'll have an answer for that for next week. At the same time, we'll make our first allocation announcement. So, um, so we've engaged industry around that question, and the, pro the proposal, people would probably know this already, was to basically modify the current policy so that if the 100% limit was reached in terms of the sum of allocations and carryover, and under current rules, um, any volume above that is lost, there would be scope potentially if that rule change is made and agreed to in the coming week, to have that lost water carried over into a following year, if that year was also a dry year in which carryover was triggered. So that particular decision is still under consideration by government, and we'll have an answer for that for next week when we make the announcement uh, on the 15th. Thanks, Dan. And, and Jared, did you want to add to that? Uh, yeah, Dan's pretty much covered everything. So in terms of carryover for, for next year, um, there was a question here around um, isn't carryover additional to your 100% uh, allocation being announced? And that's yep, not so, my so right. understanding. Yep, so basically the, the answer is no. Uh, so under the current rules, it's very clear that 100% is the limit. And even the policy that was consulted on by the board in the last sort of several months uh, maintains that limit. So at no time can anyone have more than 100% under the current or the proposed rules. And that's a very simple reason. I guess people would know that, that um, the state has a long-term obligation under the original cap and now the basin plan to manage irrigation utilisation at 90% uh, or below. So the current conservative approach to managing allocations can carry over is trying to maintain irrigation use under that 90% limit. That's why industry wanted us to bring in 100% cap when what was consulted on in previous years. So both under the current policy and the proposed policy, that limit is maintained. And any move away from that limit would effectively put everyone's reliability for allocations at risk because we'd get closer and closer to breaching that 90% usage limit. Thanks, Dan. That's great. Um, and for mine, a clear explanation as to where it's at. And there was obviously a, a few questions coming in on that um, from across the participants in the webinar. 